Meanwhile, Jules was finally able to be reunited with his father. Yeah, it was a, a good feeling uh, to be reunited again and, and started uh, the new life here. The best moment was uh, when we meet again at the airport, of course. So it was a big, uh, a big moment to return them and see, see them alive and see them uh, they were growing up and they studying. And that was a big moment. Jules' wife Larissa was another Burundian refugee who hadn't seen her parents for many years. So when I saw them, oh, they were very surprised because they had grown up. <laughs> they imagined me as a child, but then I was a teenager, so a shock as well for them, but good for me. A few years later, the family were delighted when she met and married Jules. The wedding happened in 2007, beautiful summer day. There were few guests there, not as many as you would have had a wedding in Africa. We had limits of people because of the coast. A lot of things have happened since we got married. We've got my daughter who's just over two and a half. The other thing that I'm quite afraid of in our culture, women or well, girls don't leave their houses until you get married. And so in Kiwi culture, that doesn't really happen. Whoever's 16 for that matter can just move on. And that's not what I would like for my daughter. <laughs> Yeah, so we, we do have values that I would like to keep, really. Because even here at home, we mix languages. So for my daughter, the sort of heritage she will have, I really don't know. But certainly, it's going to be a challenge because I can see in our house, we speak a lot of, you know, we speak Hirundi, we speak French, we speak English. And yeah, she's mixing up all those languages. And the kids that she plays with, most of them are Kiwis, obviously. Growing in New Zealand, she'll have a, a Kiwi culture. <laughs> so it's really a huge um, challenge for me. Ten years after they left the refugee camp, Remy's family is still not complete. The fate of his nephew is still unknown. I'm just uh, kind of thinking maybe he will manage to make it because who knows, you know? He has been surviving from many issues, so I think this is the last destination for him, could not be a really big problem, but he's the first time to travel alone and uh, without no one to help him, but probably will make it. At Auckland Airport, Burundian and former refugee Remy is resigned to the harsh reality that he may not be reunited with his adopted orphan nephew. By the time people will be coming out, I will know that he's around here because the plane now is processing. Hopefully that he's here. Zab. Zabi. <laughs> At last, Zabulon has appeared. After three years' struggle, he is reunited with his family. Zabu. And how does it feel to see your family again? Where are you going to He's very happy and uh, very grateful about it because it's going to be his life and his family and so he, he's very thankful about it. Yet the battle to get Zabulon here has come at a cost. What we want to avoid is that they aren't forced to go to people who will lend at very high rates of interest because then they're just in a terrible situation of debt so that they might solve the problems of the family coming but bring that family into a very stressed financial situation which is not helpful. It's a big sacrifice for me and for my family because I used uh, almost 3,000 for buying his only one-way ticket from Nairobi to New Zealand. Seeing the strain on refugee families like Remy's prompted leaders of refugee communities in Auckland to advocate for an independent trust to be established to fundraise and distribute grants. Travel has to occur within one year of the visa being issued. So that can be really stressful if the family members know that they've gone through all this work, they've got the visa, but they haven't got the money to pay for the air tickets. We work from the criteria of extreme vulnerability before we are able to approve a donation. Yet the barriers to reunification are not always financial. My brother has a, a daughter who is a victim of uh, war. She lost her leg 
if I was able to bring her to giving her a chance to study and uh, helping my family, I would be grateful to get, to get her here to, to help them. Under New Zealand's current rules, Jean-Pierre's niece can't come to New Zealand because she's not his own child. New Zealand thinking on the family is just the nuclear family, not the extended family. They could extend the definition of family. It could maybe have helping to better resettlement and better reunification as well. And the numbers that are successful in getting visas are very small. And I think that sometimes there are mischievous perceptions in the community that there will be waves of people coming. There are not waves of people coming. There are tiny numbers that are coming. And the tiny numbers that do come make huge differences to those family members in becoming established in New Zealand. Jean-Marie is working to advance these issues as a community chairman. As a community, we try to make sure we have a vision which is going to make the community succeed and look better as a community. I don't care what kind of job they do, but at least looking after themselves. No one begging, no one ending into drugs and those kind of things. It's making sure the family in which the child is growing is stable. That's where we come together as a community and see if we can help one another. Jean-Marie is also the leader of the Auckland Burundian drumming group. The group includes Remy and his nephew Zabulon, who has now been in New Zealand for a month. So um, he's not really much affected because he knows he was prepared, he knows that he was going to, lose, to, to leave them and also uh, much focus for him is to, be, to get a new life. Remy's daughter Katya, who's been here much longer, has a clear idea of where her future lies. My ambition in life is to become a criminologist. And like I keep on like asking people like what subjects do you think like I should take at school like to help me in my future after school, like go to university, get a scholarship like everyone else does. The adults in the community have all worked hard to become contributing members of Kiwi society. Jean-Marie, for example, has qualified as an electrical engineer. The stereotype of, you know, being refugees, being someone who is creating problems, who is, you know, it's a wrong view of the person. It's not the fact that they are refugees, that they are bad people. There are people who are looking for opportunities, and there are people who can achieve in their lives, and the people who can contribute to the society. Jules works for Telecom Gen I as an IT network engineer. I remember obviously when uh, my manager came and talked to me and says, look, we're thinking of, you know, putting you up as one of the seniors. So, wow. And obviously that was a great feeling and, you know, a great feeling of uh, success that you, you know, they're obviously doing something right. <laughs> Jules' wife Larissa is also climbing the corporate ladder. I've now completed the bachelor um, in business studies. And after that, I um, got employed. Uh, I'm now working with the bank, ANZ National Bank, where I work in financial advisory. Jean-Pierre Karabaragomba. Jules' father, Jean-Pierre, has gained a master's in business studies. Now I am working for an NGO, a CBN which is part of an international pool of 10 countries contributing to fundraise for overseas projects for people with disabilities around the world. Remy is a social worker intern at Refugee Services. When I got the scholarship, uh, I found it easy for me because it's an area I understand, an area which I have been myself through. So working with refugees is something which I like for the moment and I just I'm happy where I am from today. Alexis has found things a bit harder. I was a teacher, but here I can't teach. With my, my, my funny English, I can't teach. But rather than give up, Alexis now has his own commercial cleaning business. I didn't come for myself, I, I did come for my family. If my kids just uh, grow up and uh, improve in the school, I, I would like it. I haven't come to sit down 
now I'm commercial cleaning. People may think that it is funny because I am a cleaner, but uh, I, I enjoy it because uh, now it helps me to get a bread for my, my family and uh, we are living. So that's just the responsibility we do for the moment. So now I am not afraid of being killed. So new, we have been lucky to be in New Zealand, which is a peaceful country and a democratic one. The democracy works here. Yeah. It is not like in Burundi you have to fight for, for it. I, was, I remember when I was talking with my boss on the last elections, there was a lot of worry around uh, who will win national uh, labor. I told him, what, whatever happens tomorrow, we'll be back to work tomorrow on Monday. Refugees want to start a new life. Many want that second chance to life because to me, when you are living in some of the conditions that people live in, you are really dead, pretty much. So people need that second chance. The entire Burundian community is committed to keeping their culture alive and showing it off to their fellow Kiwis. Ladies and gentlemen, a bit of noise for Burundian drummers. <laughs> Drums are sacred in Burundi and represent royalty, fertility and regeneration. And after two months in New Zealand, Zabulon is happy undergoing his own regeneration. For someone who is uh, almost new, I mean, uh, he did work. Yeah, he did work. He's um, integrating. He's new in a, in a team, but as far as the drumming is concerned and being part of the community is concerned, you can't tell if he's new or not. <laughs> you know, that's, that's the good thing. And we always try in a community to make everyone feel you know, comfortable, particularly those who are new. So yeah, it's good. Supporting local content so you can see more of New Zealand on air.